welcome to Delta America. Cross picking is flat picking basically. Flat picking itself is when you're playing, instead of strumming, which is all strings all the time, flat picking is one note at a time. So it could be um, flat picking melody, or it could be uh, arpeggiating through chords. That's all flat picking. Cross picking is very specific in that you're not only flat picking, but you're also hopping over a string. So if I was playing an L-shaped chord, instead of playing all the strings across like this, I would skip the middle string like this. That's cross picking. And just by nature of having a three string instrument, when we do arpeggios, we tend to roll in groups of three because we got three strings. The problem with that is that that would be great for three quarter time and four four time there's still one note that needs to be repeated out of those three and so you want to come back on one of those strings doing the middle string is one way or starting over again So you have to find ways to kind of shoehorn a four into a three and, and vice versa. Or you could just do something like this. Cross picking that allows you to do it in groups of two. It also calms the roar of the drone down just a little bit, just to have two notes kind of working against each other. That's one good example of it, but basically these cross-picking patterns are just working through a chord-based scale, based off of the D major scale, and also they're all L-shaped chords, and it's just one basic pattern. So we pick, we're going across, we're crossing over that string to the bass, and then we're coming to the middle and then back to the bass. And that forms a different sort of pattern. That works for 4-4 four, four time really nicely. So that first exercise is exactly what I'm doing right there, is just nothing's changing on the bass string, nothing's changing on the middle string, but we're working that melody and we're moving up and down. The, uh, and the exercises are all eight measures long, so those first two lines are the first exercise. The second exercise is uh, bringing in harmony on the middle string, and we're one bit by bit, string by string, putting in all the elements of an L-shaped chord. So whereas we started with this, now we'll do this, and bring in the middle string. The third exercise, top two lines on page, to uh, bring in the entire chord. So we start off here, and then and then finally the last exercise actually puts an eighth rest in, and you end up with this. Um, so this will be on the video, and we'll save this for homework for you to work on later. Uh, be aware of the fact that uh, when you reach the diminished C-sharp C diminished chord, that is not going to be an L shape. It's going to be that funky little weird C-sharp diminished shape that we talked about earlier. So make sure that as you're dragging that shape up the fretboard for everything else, that you alter the shape for C-sharp diminished when you get there. before you get to the last chord, which is gonna be the D major. That's for you guys to take home and work on. It's a, a great skill set builder.
that'll get you thinking more creatively about how to arpeggiate through chords and, um, and how to move them around at the same time. Uh, it's a lot easier to move a chord when you're arpeggiating through it sometimes than it is to land the whole chord because that chord is like three notes and then they gotta be three notes here and then those three notes have gotta be here. If you're arpeggiating, you can go from the chord and then come over and then hit one note, the melody note of the chord, and then lay in your other two. And then you can do the same thing again. And again, this is sort of like a, this is a, this is Oh Holy Night. And uh, watch how I sort of just arpeggiate almost through the whole thing. I'm stringing it all together with arpeggios, but I don't have to go chord, ah, chord, ah. I can go. And while I'm busy laying that melody down there, that gives me time while it lands to go ahead and walk the other notes in there. So I don't have to be like bam, bam, bam all of a sudden. I can stagger how I move those chords along. That's a lot easier sometimes. So sometimes what we do is because it sounds good, and sometimes what we do is because it's easy. There's a lot of instances of that in, uh, in music history, for certain. All right, let's take a look at My Heart Will Go On and see how much we can get under our fingers. Yeah. When you, when you come back on the little tree, you put up towards you or you just walk away? Um, it depends on... Is it up to you? It, it's up to you and it depends on uh, if you're using alternating pick direction or not, if you're going back and forth. Um, but typically, that's one of those things where if you're going this direction, you'll hit it from this side. If you're coming back, you'll hit it from this side. Okay. So if you're going back and forth, it'll land where it should. Okay. Typically what I like to do is I like to go out on the quarter notes, on numbers, I like to go out on numbers, come in on ands. So if it's all quarter notes, it's not moving really quickly, I can just kind of take my time and do this. But if it goes to an eighth note in the middle of a phrase, I'll go boom, boom. And what that does is it resets me for eighth notes, so that means I'll always be going out on the ones. So I don't have to worry about, all, all of a sudden I'm in strumming on my downbeats and it's messing up my mojo kind of a thing. So uh, I'd like to go through and just sort of, you know, keep it moving or else it all falls, to, it all falls apart <laughs> pretty quickly. go 
goes into the repeat, comes back around, and then we wrap up with the way we opened up the thing there. Um, so, let's take a moment here to do what we, well, we did this in the first period, so I'll explain it again for you guys. What I like to do with somebody else's tablature is do a, a quick survey of everything that's there, because the first time we go into a piece, we want, of course, we want to play it up to speed, we want to play it well, but we've never seen it before. So we don't know how the voicings are or where the melody might do this and do that. And in our excitement to go and play it, uh, we don't take a look at everything, all the pitfalls that may be laying there. And we encounter them like two beats before we're supposed to be there. And then our brain's like, how do we handle this? And it's too late. You get a little train wreck going on. You're like, oh, I'll just deal with that later. Yes, you will, because you programmed it into yourself to have that little bobble. And now you have to remind yourself not to do that again and get it out of your system. So I like to take a look at everything real good so that I know what's coming up and, uh, and can deal with it, figure out my fingerings, and then go, okay, I got this to the point where I'm ready. It's almost like a dress rehearsal for playing it your first time. All right, let's go ahead and jump into it. Really, really nice and slow with this. So we've got a couple of pickup notes there on the beat number four. So I'm just gonna count us in with one, two, three. Ba -dum -ba. Nice and slow. One, two, three. Two, three. Two, three. Two, three. Put one and two back on the uh, one, two, three, four.
two, three, four, one. And B minor stop, put three and four up, and we'll wrap this puppy. One, two, three, four. Two, three, four. Two, three. Second ending. All right, good. And um, you'll also notice I didn't do it when I ran through it the last time because I wanted to make sure that you were hearing what you were seeing. I do a lot of little tiny things like coming back against the string, counterpoint moves to kind of keep things moving. I'll give you an example of that real quick from the beginning. And these are things that I wouldn't dare notate because it would cloud up what we're actually looking for, which is melody and the supporting chords and the rhythm to keep it simple. If I had tabbed out all this other stuff I'm doing, it would have been hard to discern what's what and that's just messy tab. So I'll show you what I'm doing though. Um, this is how I perform it when I'm playing it. I won't do the whole thing, but I'll just do this. those little tick, tick, tick. They're just sort of timekeepers, little placeholders for rhythm more than anything else. You know, but you know, so it's, after a while you either develop a feeling for too little, too much, and you'll find a place and you'll just start doing it. Again, it's one of those things. I never saw anybody else do it, but I thought this song needs something, but sometimes you don't want to do a fill-in rhythm, like rhythm's overkill, it's way too much. But sometimes just a kiss against that bass string when you're coming back is enough to keep things moving. Stylistically, sometimes it's great. With this song in particular, you'll notice there's one place where I don't do it. That's right here. That's, that is everything. That right there. People, if you play that, if you just go, more than likely some people are like, oh, that's Titanic, you know? But that's a big moment in the tune, and it's a quiet moment the first time, and the second time it's a big show-stopping moment. The first time I do it, it's this. The second time I do it is when all the drums come in and everything else, and I go. And what I do over here, extra-wise, 
is only happening on the bass string and on the middle string. So if the melody is going, I can do this all I want to and it won't chop up that melody. That's an engine right there. Just going back and forth between the bass and the middle string is enough to keep it going. to the melody and if you listen to the original version of it, it'll tell you what to do.